So that yeah. everyone is welcome back. Thank you. Vlad is a chemical engineer from the University of Belgrade in Serbia. And he worked as a chemical engineer for a few years back in Serbia. And he came to JK in 2007 to start his PhD mainly in the area of uh, microwave. <coughs> he completed his uh, PhD in 2012 and then he started working with the JK as a research fellow till uh, last uh, April. And the title of his presentation today is the Synthetic Oil Samples to Test Microwave uh, Applicator and the Process. Yes. Thank you, Sam. Uh, <coughs> It's uh, good to be back at uh, JK, and um, I'm very pleased to um, have this opportunity after a long time to show some of the work that uh, we did under uh, Camp Center. Um, finally, we got uh, clearance to publish some of the work, and uh, I think uh, you'll find this uh, very interesting. Um, so, as Sam said, uh, I'll, I'll be talking about synthetic uh, core samples that we use to test uh, uh, microwave, or they can be uh, used for test uh, uh, microwave applicators and uh, processes. And uh, uh, some, some of you uh, might have seen this presentation during our communication meeting, but uh, I've changed it uh, slightly. And uh, I'm pleased that uh, just um, uh, two days ago, uh, I actually got this email. Uh, so I managed to publish this work in the Journal of uh, Materials Processing Technology. So I changed the title to published work. So that was uh, really good news. Um, so I'll just start by um, giving a little bit of introduction about the uh, cavities. And uh, uh, what we try to do is uh, to test uh, our uh, ores and to see whether we can use microtechnology to improve the separation uh, of the um, <clears throat> uh, ore which contain uh, uh, copper bearing uh, minerals. And uh, we can see that uh, here uh, we have uh, a load which is within a cavity that uh, we want to treat with uh, microwaves. And, um, uh, microwave uh, heating inside the cavity is uh, not uniform, so it depends on various factors uh, such as uh, cavity geometry, uh, properties of treated material, and of course uh, the frequency which uh, we are using. In this case we were using uh, 2.45 uh, GHz. Um, there is a number of factors that uh, needs to be considered such as particle shape, uh, you can see here size, uh, the electric properties of material, and uh, of course spacing uh, of particles on conveyable. Uh, so for a variable field such as ore particles, uh, applicator design can be optimized um, to enhance microprocessing. So uh, of course later microprocessing can lead to improvements in physical uh, separation of the minerals. Uh, therefore, we can say that it is beneficial to test applicators uh, for evaluation of their efficiency uh, with design loads uh, which have specific uh, properties. So, what is it all about? Well, uh, these are the real world fragments and uh, if we were to put our x-ray goggles on and wanted to see how much these uh, real or uh, fragments uh, are different. We can see that there are uh, lots of different uh, mineral textures. For example, here uh, we can clearly distinguish um, uh, copper bearing uh, sulfides which are with higher density represented here in the darker uh, gray color. Uh, and then uh, again minerals, uh, in this case it was a uh, quartz uh, which is in a higher, uh, lighter uh, gray. And we can also see that in this specific uh, uh, raw <coughs> particles, that the grains are more clustered to each other. But then we have a different texture here where the minerals are mostly in one plane of the particle where the remaining part of uh, uh, quartz is pretty much without mineralization. And as we turn around for 45 degrees, the particles, as we rotate, we can see that they are all kind of uh, located within one plane. 
And then again, in this specific particle, we can see uh, that mineral grades are much smaller compared to the first one. But then they're uh, disseminated through uh, the volume of the particle itself. <coughs> so we have different texture, we have different minerals, we have uh, different uh, gain minerals. And, and um, uh, we have to uh, kind of put everything into one uh, particle that we can define well so that we can actually perform optimization of uh, the applicator uh, that we want to use. So, how do we use it? Well, we have to consider a lot of things. So, uh, we have to engineer samples which can be reusable. Well, that's logical because if you're going to test something repeatable and more, more times, we have to reuse the same samples. So they have to reflect the real world particles. They can't just fall apart or break down that easy. So we have to have predefined pro properties such as density, mineral content, volume, and we also have to have specific geometry. Uh, we have to have specific, specific dielectric properties, specific thermal properties, especially when we are uh, heating them. We have to know uh, how they are heating. Uh, and, of course, uh, specific mechanical properties, as I said earlier, uh, which are connected with uh, the reusable. So, solution might be something like this. It looks very complicated, <laughs> but uh, is it? So, uh, I would like now to actually spend a little bit uh, to uh, explain um, about the electric properties and why they're important when uh, we try to heat um, materials or treat them with microwaves. Uh, the electric property is important because uh, they influence how the material will heat up or respond to microwaves. And here uh, we have lots of different material including water over here, which we can see it's very responsive. So uh, if we go further to the left side of the diagram, we have materials which are less responsive um, to microwaves, and in this case you can see the quartz is uh, along Teflon very far, which means it doesn't uh, respond well or it doesn't heat up as much, for example, as uh, water or clay, for example here, which uh, has 20% of moisture. So how that relates to minerals? Well, we also have here uh, the electric properties for two different frequencies, 915 uh, and 2.45. And we can see that uh, quartz is uh, uh, much less responsive. Usually we use uh, loss ta tangent to uh, describe uh, materials, how well they will um, respond to microwave heating. So if you compare quartz to, let's say, charcoal part, we can see that there is a, almost like six or seven times different, which means that charcoal part will heat seven times faster compared to quartz, which puts us uh, uh, in space of um, selective uh, heating uh, or differential heating. Um, and also, um, we have to consider thermal uh, conductivity and specific heat uh, uh, properties. So, if you look just thermal conductivity, that means how fast the heat uh, will be conducted through material. Uh, and if you look quartz again uh, here, we can see that it is very uh, well uh, conductor, which means it, uh, it can conduct the heat very fast. Um, that means that if you have some minerals which are embedded in quartz that heat much uh, faster, the quartz will reflect that through conducting that heat away from the heat source. Uh, but then again, we have heat uh, capacity, which is uh, describing how much energy we should put within the specific material in order to change from one degree. So. Here we can see that gypsum, for example, it's 1070 compared to quartz, which is uh, 740. So that means that if we actually have some minerals embedded in these two different minerals, that we will have to have much more energy to, to heat up uh, if our surrounding gain minerals is gypsum compared to quartz. So we can see that things are not so easy and, and that there's a lot of things that we have to consider. Um, so there were previous studies uh, which tried to uh, um, study this differential uh, heating of minerals and uh, 
uh, Van Wert and the Condos and Black uh, perform testing with uh, cast uh, cement, which involved 4% uh, of uh, pyrite. So what they did, they had cups uh, in which uh, they uh, casted uh, cement and embedded uh, pyrite mineral grains. Uh, they used different uh, mesh sizes, uh, so they had different uh, uh, mineral grains as well. And uh, we can here see that uh, most minerals uh, are, were situated at the bottom uh, of this cone um, for cassette samples that they created. So I did also a similar uh, test with um, plaster samples in 2008. And uh, the reason for me to use plaster is that I wanted material which is very cheap, first of all, safe to use, and if necessary, uh, with that uh, material we can create a lot of sample for a, a very short time. But there are some downsides uh, to that, that same as uh, Van Wert experienced that uh, minerals started to sink at the bottom of uh, the samples, therefore uh, it was hard to uh, control the texture of minerals that uh, we wanted to study. And we can see also that I used a different size of minerals and uh, I used uh, <laughs> sky skin tomographs to, to obtain information about this texture, which was very useful. Uh, and there was also a downside of that plaster was very brittle, although it had good quality of uh, not heating up. Um, but uh, we, we still needed uh, uh, samples that, that we can reuse for, for repeatable testing. So I was thinking a lot and I came to the idea that I should use actually adhesive and somehow or to easily explain this is use a, a certain type of glue to bound everything together uh, and uh, I decided to use polymetal metacrylate uh, it is a polymer uh, and uh, we can see that it was uh, made in um, 1843 so a long time ago but, um, only started uh, being used uh, in the 19th and the 20th century. Um, I was interested to find adhesive which will give me uh, uh, samples that uh, will have a good mechanical properties that I can use, but at the same time I couldn't mask all the heating uh, phenomena that was actually happening within uh, the particles. So. I was trying to assess, uh, and I went through lots of different polymers, and uh, I uh, actually came that uh, uh, polymetal material was the best one to use. So it had the melting point 160 degrees, which was really useful for me uh, if I wanted to study uh, heating up up to 100 degrees, um, which was uh, our goal as well. And uh, also, um, the density uh, was 1.2 when we compared to a quartz and pirate. Uh, and also, uh, it had a little bit higher specific heat capacity compared to quartz, uh, well, almost two times. Uh, and thermal conductivity was also lower. And that actually meant that uh, I just need to um, uh, determine experimentally what is the minimum amount of adhesive that I can use so I still uh, get the pro uh, proper mechanical properties of synthetic samples but I don't lose on uh, thermal conductivity specific uh, uh, conductivity and all the thermal properties of the mixture so I started creating uh, samples and of course um, um, I used Polymetal metacrylate, which was, uh, well, the commercial name was uh, Liquicet, uh, which was one part liquid and uh, two parts uh, powder. And the uh, curing time was 10 to 12 minutes. Uh, so that was pretty much the time that uh, um, they would become uh, solidified. And uh, the window of uh, uh, that I can actually create my textures of the minerals. Uh, there is a slight warning here that uh, when, it, when you try to use, uh, actually when you use polymetal material, the chemical reaction is uh, exothermal, 
So I needed to use a uh, cool uh, <coughs> actually water bath uh, and uh, cool down all the components before uh, uh, mixing them up. Um, also, I created a mold out of teflon and uh, uh, had a easy. Uh, uh, it was easy just to remove this uh, floor part and uh, take the samples out. And um, uh, in in this case, uh, I for this specific uh, uh, experimental work, I had created uh, eleven samples and um, uh, randomly um, numbered them. And uh, numbers three. Five and nine uh, were dedicated to the samples. We actually had uh, mineral grains of uh, pyrite in, in them. Also used different uh, grain sizes, which we will uh, see later. And uh, it was about 20% of pyrite, with much higher increase compared to the previous work of uh, one wave, which had 4%. So uh, before I uh, started to uh, testing by heating them, I wanted to use uh, some non-destructive uh, method to assess whether uh, it's actually viable to start testing or not. And, and uh, I achieved that by using the resonant cavity technique. Uh, so this technique is um, it's used frequently to assess the electric properties uh, of uh, material. Of materials and it, it works uh, on a cavity principle where we have empty cavity and uh, uh, we measure the frequency and um, later on we insert our sample inside of the cavity, measure the frequency again and uh, using this equation we can actually calculate uh, the electric properties uh, of uh, this uh, material and as I said, the electric properties of material indication of how well the material will heat up uh, when it's treated uh, in a uh, uh, microwave cavity. And I also uh, use ASTM uh, twenty standard uh, test method uh, C just to be um, repeatable and comparable to some other materials. Um, so these are the results. And just to explain uh, these numbers, so I tried to compare uh, three samples which didn't have any minerals inside and uh, compare them with three, mineral, uh, three samples uh, which actually had uh, pirate. And we can clearly see here that there is a, a difference between <laughs> these two groups. So minerals which, uh, uh, synthetic particles which uh, don't have pirate compared to the one which have. And um, I also repeated that testing uh, to account for depolarization uh, effect. Um, in the previous method where we measured electric properties, uh, depolarization effect is achieved uh, if the sample is moved within the cavity. So in this case, um, I rotated uh, these cubes uh, for the 45 degrees uh, for the second measurement compared to the first one when they were placed into the cavity parallel to the cavity walls. So, then I needed to test uh, these synthetic particles for uh, their mechanical properties, uh, which meant that uh, if they were about to be transported by conveyor belts or just uh, tumbled through the cavity, they needed to be um, uh, rough enough to, to withstand all that repeatable testing and then I decided well uh, what is the best taste, test to use it then uh, JK standard abrasion test and uh, as we can see I had a couple of uh, uh, real ore particles um, along with uh, synthetic particles tumbling uh, for uh, five minutes and uh, it was standard speed of uh, 53 rpm and uh, we can see here that uh, exhibited the same treatment as the real ore fragments. For example, this we can see the sharp edges here, but after tumbling, the, uh, um, the, the edges were lost. And the same uh, effect we can see here on the synthetic uh, particle. So there were, that was a good uh, test to actually 
uh, prove that they can withstand repeatable testing, which was one of the conditions. Um, and of course, remember saying at the beginning, we used our uh, X-ray uh, glass as well. This is what I used to uh, get insights in the texture of the particles uh, and, uh, again, synthetic particles. So I used sky scan tomograph. Uh, particles were placed in tomograph and then uh, um, we had X-ray source uh, collecting, uh, which were actually collected on the um, um, plates uh, here on detectors and uh, that allowed me to create uh, uh, X-ray images and as well uh, do reconstructive uh, analysis of, of the textures. So these are the results and uh, just to explain what are these degrees, so um, samples were placed, so this was uh, uh, zero degrees and then they were rotated 360 de degrees around their vertical axis. So in images here this means that uh, this is, we're looking straight forward through the uh, particle and this is often being rotated for the 45 uh, degrees. And this is one of the mar uh, particles that didn't have any uh, mineral uh, texture inside. So we can see that uh, matrix itself was very uh, uniform. Uh, and uh, this is the uh, synthetic uh, particle uh, label uh, cube number three. And uh, we can see here different uh, mineral grains embedded uh, within the uh, synthetic particle and here reconstructed, uh, reconstructed uh, plane which was uh, shown here in a green line and we can see the minerals 1, 2, 3 and 4 which are situated here 1 and 2, 2 behind number 1 and again here uh, another 4 minerals so the idea behind this uh, texture was to have uh, four distinctive, distinctive uh, grains which will reflect on the surface of the particles but I'll, I will explain that later on uh, then uh, particle uh, or cube number five um, we have three uh, mineral grains which are larger in size so the previous one was with the smallest uh, mineral uh, grains. Uh, as I stepped up, uh, I uh, reduced the number of uh, mineral grains. And uh, they were um, arranged within the large uh, diagonal of the cube. So you can see if the uh, diagonal is here, they are arranged with that uh, plane. Uh, and uh, this is also reconstructed image uh, here, so we can see um, grain number one on the top and grain number two here being cut, so that's that green one. And of course at the end, um, with the largest uh, mineral grain, uh, I embedded it inside of the uh, cube number nine. And we can see it's um, embedded straight in the middle of the cube and this is the reconstructed uh, image of the minerals. So here I would like just to briefly uh, explain how the heating is done and um, we have uh, for most uh, microwave applicators we have a generator which is situated here with a magnetron so magnetron is producing microwaves which are then conducted through waveguides uh, to an applicator. Now this applicator is simplified here and just shown uh, as a box uh, but um, it's, uh, we can see that here we'll, we can achieve multi, uh, uh, a lot of uh, multi modes and eventually what we want to achieve is the uniformity of the uh, electromagnetic field but just to explain uh, this uh, I know it's hard to kind of imagine the modes, so I'll just use I'll briefly exit from the presentation, and I will use this uh, application to actually explain 
when we talk about propagating waves through the wave gun. So this would be if so this would be our waveguide and as we can see here uh, we have traveling wave that is going here so in this case uh, this would be a waveguide coming through the waveguide into the applicator and then once, once the waveguide enters uh, we can see that the cavity changes that means that dimension now uh, will change so I will use this uh, to change dimension of the cavity so make it a little bit uh, wider and uh, we'll change the height as well which will then eventually uh, because we have steers as well create lots of different modes so if you have different modes things get a little bit more complicated so these are, these, this is this is a representation of what we actually have uh, inside of this applicator. Now we can see now, if I change this dimension, they will change. And if I change the width, the, the modes will change as well. And we can see that just changing dimension of the applicator, we can uh, try to achieve better conditions to treat our materials. Well, once it's actually placed in the cavity. <coughs> so, so in this case, this would be for a batch process, but uh, imagine that you have conveyor belt going uh, continuously through applicator. We can see that that can complicate even more things. So, I'll just go back to the front. There we go. So, we can see that uh, what we want to achieve here is uh, many modes as we can in order to uh, obtain more unified uh, electromagnetic field so that our load when it actually passes through gets even chance to be exposed to as many modes uh, as it can. In, in the case uh, for this specific experiment I use uh, two types of applicator. The first was very easy to use because it was just domestic microwave oven <coughs> and the second one was uh, uh, applicator in shape of the waveguide. Now we can see here again um, exit where the microwaves are coming inside and this was the dimensions of microwave oven and I decided to place all my samples along the diameter of the microwave tray uh, so we have here from 1 to 11 and then the rotation, that, this was a fixed uh, uh, position and then uh, uh, when I repeated uh, uh, these exposures uh, this was a free rotation around uh, their axis and uh, these are the, this is an infrared image uh, taken uh, 5 seconds uh, after exposure because that was the time that I needed to take the tray and put in front of the infrared uh, camera and the uh, temperature was measured by placing the region of interest uh, over the cubes so that we can measure the mean temperature uh, mean temperature is defined as uh, mean temperature of all the pixels within the region of interest and a maximum temperature which is belongs to the pixel with the highest temperature within the region of uh, interest and here uh, we can see now um, different patterns here four grains which kind of merge together uh, then uh, in the second texture we can see those uh, grains over here and of course the last one uh, which was embedded in the middle um, we can see uh, here and I would just like to comment here that this is a very specific pattern because if you remember we only had particle within the side of the cube which means that uh, the heat is actually dissipating equally uh, the same speed uh, to the surface of the particle but, but considering that we have cubes we can see that edges of the cubes are the coldest while the heat is dissipating um, with the pretty much uh, the same flux uh, from the center of the cube where the uh, heating is actually occurring 
Now, this is, these are the results. We can see here that uh, um, synthetic <coughs> samples which have which had uh, particles uh, or uh, pirate grains inside are clearly distinguishable uh, from all the remaining ones. So the temperature uh, difference, if it take three, about three degrees, we can see that uh, tracers in this case or uh, particles which had uh, pirates three, five, and nine are above. And uh, this is, as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, average uh, te uh, mean temperature and average maximum temperature with the, their standard uh, deviation. So each uh, uh, heating was repeated three times and then I calculated the standard deviation. Uh, now, I said, well, okay, so that's, that's one applicator. Well, can we, can we achieve better results than just changing a type of applicator, changing conditions? Uh, and um, I decided to use a uh, waveguide applicator. Um, so most industrial um, micro applicators look like this. So this is a part of tuner. Uh, this was my waveguide, which allowed me to insert my particles uh, inside of the cavity. And I had a particle holder, uh, holder uh, inside, which placed them straight in the middle of the waveguide. And um, of course, microwave generated infrared camera was uh, recording above. And uh, also, uh, I was measuring this uh, in uh, real time. So there was no five seconds delay before measurement. I can actually measure straight as they were heating up. And um, of course, I got better results. So here on the surface, we can clearly distinguish heating patterns uh, which are uh, coming from those uh, four particles uh, which were embedded. Uh, then in uh, uh, cube uh, number five, we can see that uh, there is a, uh, a different pattern. Uh, those two grains which were closer to the surface kind of merged into one pattern. And of course, the last one uh, which had uh, um, only one uh, mineral grain inside, we can see that uh, same, same effect as in multiple uh, cavity, that heat is actually centered uh, within the uh, uh, center of the cube. And uh, much, much better results. So uh, same average uh, delta um, uh, T mean and average delta T maximum. Um, and we can see that compared to all the other one which didn't have anything inside, uh, we can clearly distinguish Three, five, and nine um, from all the other ones, and uh, even the standard deviation is uh, much uh, smaller compared to the previous. So, conclusions. Um, well, there was there was also conclusions from this uh, uh, experimental work. Uh, first, that uh, polymetal material proved to be a good choice of <laughs> polymer adhesive. Uh, for uh, synthetic uh, ore particles. Um, also, experimental testing uh, showed that there was no more significant mechanical damage uh, when compared to uh, real ore fragments made of uh, quartzite. And also that um, uh, there was a minimum damage when we used uh, standard JK abrasion test. Uh, tomography results uh, really showed that uh, the larger mineral grains did not have tendency uh, to sink uh, to the bottom of synthetic particles um, as it was reported uh, earlier for plaster or uh, casting cement. Uh, also the presence of adhesive polymer uh, within synthetic uh, particles did not significantly change its bulk dielectric properties compared to the properties of pulverized quartz uh, sand which was uh, chosen as a uh, uh, whole stroke uh, mineral or again you know uh, then difference in uh, bulk dielectric properties uh, between synthetic particles uh, and characterized traces and um, uh, particles without pirate minerals was easily measured along um, the polarization effect uh, and um, 
Chasers were recognized in both types of uh, uh, microwave heating experiments uh, with multi-mode cavity and the waveguide uh, cavity. Uh, also, the microwave heating experiments show that uh, mineral texture created was uh, detectable uh, and useful to investigate heat dissipation from mineral grays into the host uh, uh, rock mineral and uh, polymetal material uh, mixture. Um, repeatable testing uh, uh, enabled to calculate possible error in temperature difference which can be measured on the surface of the particles with proposed experimental settings. Uh, and also synthetic particles um, lead to process optimization. Pro uh, they can be used to optimize applicators and uh, achieve more uniform uh, treatment. Um, which is necessary for ore testing, specifically uh, because ore by itself is, is variable in so many um, forms like uh, the size, the shape, uh, the minerals which are in ore fragments, etc. So we can see if we go back on that list of tests and I said, well, it's too complicated to make. Well, we can see we kind of ticked all the boxes. so. We engineered samples which can be reusable. Uh, we had predefined properties uh, by defining the mineral host, the minerals of our interest, which was in pirate, and uh, the adhesive. Uh, we had uh, density, mineral content, volume, all uh, We had also specific geometry, which enabled us to uh, test um, applicator, but at the same time to um, test uh, the electric properties of uh, those mixtures and um, also uh, we had uh, predefined thermal properties and, and the, again I said uh, uh, mechanical properties so it was uh, we kind of tick all the boxes and um, as I said earlier it, it really helped us to experimentally validate some of the modeling uh, which was done and uh, study further how texture is actually influencing what we see on the surface of the particles. So, yeah, that will, that will be it. Thank you. So uh, that I did uh, actually trial and error on a couple of occasions, and uh, um, I performed about eleven different experiments uh, in variety of five percent up to the fifteen, and uh, experimentally uh, I determined that ten percent was uh, the minimum that I can go uh, without compromising mechanical properties, because uh, everything uh, less than ten percent. It was still crumble. We tried to separate. They were still um, uh, very tough. But then, when I performed the tumbling tests, they they were just uh, uh, crumble. Yeah. The, the quartz grains used in size were they mono size or size of solution? Uh, no, no, no. It was it was uh, they were pulverized and they were uh, under uh, 106 microns. They were sieved, and then they were just, yeah. So it was one side. Yeah. A distribution below 106. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and, and the next, uh, what's the next? Uh, 106 and then, um, yeah. yeah, 98. Yeah. So it was just below. So a narrow size distribution. Narrow size, yeah. yeah. Steve? I didn't uh, come upon 
thermal runaway or sparks or anything because uh, spe especially with these ones uh, the one which didn't have mineral grains they were really behaving as uh, uh, quartz uh, polymetric uh, belongs to a group of polymers same as teflon it, it it's really has a poor response to microwaves so it wouldn't heat up at all and then it combined with quartz um, you don't change the electric properties that much so you can easily treat it with high power I even went to 3.5 kilowatts uh, in, in single single mode cavity which is a lot of power and I, yeah, it would only heat up slightly maybe up to 10 degrees and this is the reason why um, I didn't want to put uh, too much minerals and I didn't want to heat them up too much because I had the limit if you remember polymetric it was 160 degrees until it reached its melting point so I was keeping everything under 100 degrees but is it because the particles are inside the sample and not the surface of the particle? Uh, what do you mean? Your, your mineral samples are embedded in the sample yeah, in, in, right. within, within the so uh, found it on the surface you have direct impact on the micro and so forth yeah. yeah. Well, uh, the, the, the matrix itself, which is comprised of quartz and, and uh, polymer, is very non-responsive. So, in that regard, you can heat it up uh, a lot with microwaves, but just because it doesn't respond well, you can increase power, it still won't heat up. I mean, it will heat up, but not as much as pyrite. So, that's, that's why I kept that differential So in, in one case, uh, uh, as I said, you have to have a specific uh, experimental settings because of different applicators. So I tried to have a similar power delivery in two different applicators so they can be comparable. Um, but as I said, this is why you assess applicators because some applicator will allow you to have better coupling with your load or better uh, power delivery. And you also have to know that there is a reflected power from the cavity. This, this is why we use uh, tuner. In the case of microwave oven, I didn't have a specific tuner. So I had to rely that uh, all the power that actually comes within the microwave cavity uh, is being absorbed. While in industrial one, I could actually control that. So the power that actually goes inside uh, is the one that uh, I want to go inside. But in a Input order of that time. For example, in order to increase about 10 degree in temperature rise during the micro treatment. Oh, it was. It, 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 yeah, it was. It was 1.2 kilowatts. Yeah. yeah. But then you have to also know that uh, time. Uh, so you you can either adjust time or power. In this case, it was uh, exposure of uh, 12 seconds. Uh, the reason why I chose 12 seconds was that. That was the time that uh, my microwave tray within the oven made a full circle. In your test, uh, you only have temperature rising about uh, 10 degrees. So I assume there's no fragment uh, happen during your last test. But in the real oil, yeah. do you see any fragmentation of the tray by microwave? Um, well, as I said, in, you attended my uh, previous uh, uh, presentation where I showed how uh, there was a fragmentation. Um, it all depends uh, how well we tune into our load and how much power we want to deliver. Uh, for this specific experimental testing, the goal was not to achieve fragmentation. It was to achieve differential heating uh, on the surface of particles. Or should I say that differential enough that it can be detected with probably minimum power that we want to use so the goal was not to pump the power in the particle uh, we were trying to experiment with how 
uh, little power we can actually deliver to the particle and still achieve differential heating on the top of the surface that we can actually uh, detect with infrared detector. So there's different things involved, different goals. Yeah. Can I ask the fact that he said 1.2 kilowatts? Is that 1.2 kilowatts or something? Just watts, or is that 1.2 kilowatt hours per ton? No, 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 that's 1.2 kilowatts, yeah, on yeah. the micro. It's not, it's not calculated in, in uh, energy, uh, as, as we say, uh, liberation of yeah. No, 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 it's just pop, yeah, pop. Control um, if you want to study a specific types of minerals and how they interact with each other, or what kind of response you want. At least for uh, uh, microwave testing, but maybe that's an, another uh, project or something to just see whether they can be used for mechanical properties and how they are comparable when you test mechanical properties of real world fragments. Any particular reason? Any particular reason that you chose this uh, minus 106 plus 19 uh, silica as a filler in the uh, uh, Well, yes, because I wanted my powder to be very fine so I can uh, get a nice uh, mixture with uh, polymetamatic growth and I was mixing them together. So, um, and if you saw the x-ray images of the particle which didn't have any mineral grains, you can see that there was no difference uh, needed uh, matrix to be very uniform. And the reason why I chose very small fraction was to allow um, uh, polymetal material to be really nicely bound with the quartz. So if it starts heating up, there is no other, um, because heat will uh, go through material uh, very uh, conductive, very less con uh, conductive, actually very more conductive. So I wanted to have homogeneous mixture, so enable the, the, the heat flux to evenly go throughout the matrix. So that was the idea. Because I'm coming back to Ben's question, because the finest silica that uh, you're using improve the mechanical properties of the your PMMA and also the your filler material. We didn't actually do finely disseminated more texture. I think the smallest was it? You know, about a millimeter, small spray. Uh, actually, yeah, the, if, if you, uh, these are the results that, these are, as I said, um, I did a lot of experiments and, and uh, I 
didn't include it in this one uh, representation of my cluster um, analysis. So you can see here in this specific one that uh, I even went to a smaller uh, grain size. So this is the combination of cluster and uh, uh, charcoal part actually. Uh, and uh, in this particular one, it, it's minus 1.18 uh, plus uh, 0.85. But I went even further, small one with high dissemination. But yeah, for this specific work, I only presented one of the important. So I did experiments, but not with the same matrix. Okay, yeah. It found a disseminated one, but not the same matrix. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I did previous experiments uh, where I had different texture. This included uh, cluster. And then uh, when I started doing with polymetal metacryl, uh, I only use these uh, these sizes here. I thought it would be particularly interesting to see how disseminated with a, the same grade responds relative to discrete grains like you've got. Whether they yeah. detectable. Oh yeah, uh, but as I said, uh, this is the data I could. <laughs> Presented, yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, there, there, there's a good point there, and and this is this is why I chose um, different texture just to show that by changing sizes and where minerals embedded, uh, we will obtain a different result. You can solve the problem of setting in plaster by rotating the sample as it sits. Uh, yes, uh, that's, I mean, uh, there was another work of uh, uh, Van Baird, uh, they, they uh, tried to do that as well, uh, but uh, they didn't report anything about mechanical properties, so uh, that's, that's true, I could just rotate, but plaster still, it's not uh, um, strong enough, it will start to uh, crumble a lot. And uh, then you lose uh, repeatability. Any more questions? Okay, thank you very much.